everybody see my screen? Yes, okay. we can see your screen. That's great. Um, so thank you very uh, much. Uh, I'm just, uh, it's not in the presenter's mode, though. OK. Is that great. better? Yes. Great. yes. Um, yes. So I'll, I'll just start off by saying thank you very much, Maria, for inviting um, this presentation of our um, limnology and oceanography paper. And I just wanted to point out at the start that there's two first authors on this paper, um, Martin Lilly and myself, and it's an example of how not to write a paper in a way, because it, it started about five years ago. Um, I started with the paper and then Martin Lilly took over with most of the analysis. And then um, he um, moved to another job and I finished it. So it was a very inefficient way of writing. And we were also thrashing around because we had never worked on size spectra before. And we were really daunted by the large literature on the subject. There was an awful lot of mathematical and theoretical stuff which slightly went over our heads. So um, it was a little bit of a battle, this paper. And um, this literature has a very long history and I, um, I wanted to dedicate this paper to the memory of Trevor Platt, who was working at um, PML and passed away in the early weeks of lockdown. And he was a pioneer of a lot of the um, earlier theory and um, experimental work on biomass spectra and produced some of these landmark papers in the 1970s, um, introducing the approach of normalizing these spectra. Um, a very simple sort of background, um, the size spectra is based on the principle of attenuation of energy as you go up through the food web. So there's a whole series of inefficiencies in trophic transfer at each trophic step and inefficiencies in metabolism, which lead to an attenuation of biomass, which is measurable as the slope of these size spectra. So, for example, if you steepen the slope of size spectra, that reflects um, a series of these inefficiencies, for example, a lower predator-prey mass ratio or a lower trophic transfer efficiency. And together, all of these mean um, a less efficient energy flow to um, predators on the um, plankton, for example, the fish. Um, as I said, we were thrashing around a little bit um, with understanding what these um, slopes of the size spectra meant. And we stumbled upon this paper. It's a freshwater paper by Mayner et al. And they were using this equation. They didn't actually present the equation exactly like this in their text, but they're obviously using this equation. And this was very useful because it related the slope of the size spectrum once it was normalized, that's the S value on the left, relating it to the trophic transfer efficiency, the predator-prey mass ratio, and the body mass scaling coefficient. So in sort of round number terms, a sort of benchmark um, slope of the size spectrum is minus one, and that would equate with this equation to a 10% trophic transfer efficiency, a 10 to the four predator-prey mass ratio, and a three-quarter power scaling of the metabolism. Um, so the nice thing about this is all of those terms on the right, uh, it, all of them very, very difficult to measure in a real assemblage, but they're encapsulated in this attenuation of um, um, mass as you go through the food web, measurable by this slope value S. So we've got two objective, objectives for our paper in LNO. Um, the first one was um, looking at the resilience of the plankton system to extreme weather. And we were looking particularly at storm events because we had some um, one in a hundred year um, storm activity in the West Country and Southwest UK in the winter of 2013, 2014. So we wanted to see how this was affecting the food web and how quickly it bounced back from the storms. Um, so IPCC reports 
suggest that extreme weather events, not just storms, but um, heat waves and floods and droughts, they're projected to increase in frequency and intensity. Um, so it's useful to know how resilient the system is to these things. So look at this first objective. Um, we used the time series station from L4, and that's a, um, a weekly time series. It's been running since 1988, but we just used six years of data from that time series spanning 20, 2009 to 2014. That gave us 272 sampling points, which for the size spectra, we um, averaged into monthly blocks. So we got 72 months. Um, the important thing about the site is that it's seasonally stratified. I'll come back to that in a minute. It's a productive site, um, 50 meters of water depth. So the sampling of the site um, is quite important because we had 10 orders of magnitude range in body mass. So that was running from bacteria analyzed by flow cytometry up to fish larvae from net samples analyzed by microscopy. So we had over 300 of these taxonomic categories, which we used site-specific dimensions to convert to carbon per individual for these size categories. So that's a slightly different way of measuring size spectra to some of the automated um, plankton counters and sizes, for example, ZooScan or FlowCam, which measures can measure the dimensions and the biovolumes of individual particles. So it's a slightly different approach to size spectra. Um, so this is a 72 sampling point. Um, so it shows the interannual and the seasonal variability. The top plot is the elevation of the size spectra. That's the midpoint elevation. That's analogous to biomass in the system. So that's increasing from um, the winter into the summer stratified period, which I've um, shown with the blue band. And the bottom plot is the slope of the size spectrum. So if you remember, I um, presented a, a sort of benchmark value of minus one. These slopes are very slightly steeper than the value of minus one and also showing seasonal variability. But for this first objective, we are looking at the effects of storm events. So I said the storms were particularly severe through the winter of from December 2013 through to March 2014. It was a series of storms. So we are very perseverant with our sampling. We're able to go out um, between the storms to get an idea of the size spectrum. So that's the large red symbols. So you can see during the storms themselves, there was a depression, not only in the slope of the size spectrum, but also the biomass in the system. But the point is, um, from this, the um, system seemed to rebound very, very quickly within a month or so to the normal envelope of values. So that would suggest, even though the storms had a, a short term effect on the size spectra, the system rebounded to normal very, very quickly. And um, probably the reason for the um, disruption of the size spectrum was um, the larger end of the size spectrum, that's the copepods and the, um, the gelatinous zooplankton, they seem to be the only groups that were particularly badly affected by the storms, particularly the jellies, they're an order of magnitude down. And fortuitously, during this, um, um, period. Um, PhD student Jackie Maud at PML was looking at natural mortality of copepods and she found a significant increase in the natural mortality and increase in the number of carcasses of copepods when the wind speeds were high. So we're guessing that the extreme turbulence during these storms was actually killing the zooplankton. So the next objective, um, rather than the um, of short term extreme events, we were looking at the slower effects of climate change and eutrophication on the size spectra and how they impact on the energy flow through the planktonic food web. And in the Northeast Atlantic sector um, where we're working, there's a whole series of publications suggesting that there's a reduction in the classic food chain and an increase in the small cells and the so-called microbial food chain. I've listed some of the references there in blue. So 
these seem to stem from direct effects of warming and indirect effects through stratification and nutri nutrient stress, also reduced eutrophication in the Northwest European shelf inshore waters. So how does this affect the energy flow? So we had two approaches to look at this. First, um, similar to a plot I've shown before, by looking at the seasonal change in the slopes of the size spectra. Um, so we were trying to use the seasonality of the L4 site as we go through the summer period, the system becomes increasingly nutrient stressed during stratification. So we wanted to use that as a natural experiment of increasing nutrient stress. So we related um, these summer months slopes of the size spectrum from each of this each month in each of the six years to the recent nutrient history um, from nitrate and phosphate. So this is the plot. So basically there's a positive relationship between size spectrum slope and nitrate concentration. So when the system was nutrient starved, that's the points in the bottom left hand corner, the slope was steep, suggesting a inefficient um, energy flow through the planktonic system. So that was at the sort of seasonal um, local level using the L4 data to look at nutrient um, effects. We used a much wider scale approach using this meta-analysis. So for this we um, combined about 40 studies which um, between them gave us about 280 determinations of the size spectrum slope. So this was a global scale analysis, and it was based on freshwater, marine, and size spectra based on biovolume and mass units. That's the different symbols. So this plot shows the slope of the size spectrum against the mass or volume range used to create that size spectrum. So this is what I'd call a funnel plot, where as you go towards a larger proportion of the size spectrum of plankton that are analysed, the points on the right, the variation gets less. So we're homing in on values of size spectrum slope, which converge on a median value of around minus 1.1. So to look at how um, these spectrum slopes related to um, trophic status, we didn't use all of these data, we just used the right hand portion which were converging to more um, stable values. So we just um, used a seven orders of magnitude um, range in mass or volume unit um, to analyze the um, effects of nutrient status. But unfortunately, um, by the time um, we'd extracted those data and got parallel um, estimates of nutrient status, we were left with only four um, values. And that's largely because um, a lot of the studies, particularly the freshwater ones, they didn't um, present data in chlorophyll units or we hadn't got common units on the x-axis to relate to slope. Um, so we used the marine studies and related them to um, chlorophyll. And there's a suggestion here, at least a best statistical fit of a sort of dome shape relationship. Um, it's a little bit, um, we, you know, we, we were suggesting a dome in the LNO paper, but I think quite honestly, most people would say you need a little bit more data. Um, and just going back to that issue, in the literature there's been a whole range of analyses of slopes of size spectra, um, the NBS slope against the um, nutrient status expressed in different ways. Some studies, particularly those um, on low to medium nutrients, um, are suggesting a positive or hyperbolic relationship. We were suggesting a dome-shaped relationship which would um, rationalize um, estimates both of a negative and a positive relationship. But I think um, what we want to do is look in a little bit more detail and um, get a bigger range of values um, towards um, a, a more complete meta-analysis and a more complete understanding. Because obviously with changing degrees of eutrophication 
or climate change in temperate waters, which might be leading to nutrient um, starvation due to stratification. We need to know how this is affecting the, um, the um, slope of the biomass spectrum. So that's my last slide. And I just wanted to finish with um, a couple of potential discussion points to get any discussion going. Um, the first one is we want to continue this meta-analysis um, with a wider range of studies. So we want to, in the first instance, to combine what we've compiled already with another parallel meta-analysis that was done by Axel Rosberg and colleagues published in Nature Communications in 2019. Want to put those two together, add any more um, data, which is um, to make it tractable, we want to um, set some provisos on that. They're listed in the blue italics there. And a few other potential discussion points. Number two, on how we relate these slopes to environmental variables. What scales um, of variation should we look at? Um, are we looking at seasonal variation or should we be using a single value for a system? For example, I'd be very interested in whether other people are using these slopes to uh, for sort of policy to meet policy objectives or to diagnose ecosystem health or ecosystem resilience. Likewise, I'm interested to know about resilience to extreme events, including heat waves, and also the interrelationships, for example, in trophic transfer efficiency and predator prey mass ratio, which seem to vary with body size themselves, even though they're combining to produce linear size spectra. So I'll finish there. Um, I've probably gone on for well over 10 minutes. So just um, leave it open for discussion. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. <laughs>